Hello guys, I'm here today with Jerome Armstrong, who is a expert in high intensity training. He's got several certifications to his name and he thinks very carefully about the things that he puts out online on the internet. So this is something you do not want to miss. If you want to know anything more about him, he does have a website, 80minutefitness.com. And he also trains clients in and out of his studio, consults with people over the phone and has a large array of good quality, fine, fine services, which I highly recommend. Um, so Jerome, how are you doing today? Doing well, Jonathan. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. So I wanted to interview to you today about um, the carnivore diet and your experience over the last few years. I mean, to this day now, I'm thinking it's around about five years since you started. So how's that been yeah, going for you? Yeah, near as I can figure, started back in 2018. And it's um it's been quite the journey. I think I've tried the entire spectrum of carnivore expression. Um, but it's it's been it's been great and it's a, a continual journey and it's fun to kind of see how your body changes and your dietary needs and preferences change over a period of time. But I'm really enjoying watching the online carnivore space grow and, and hearing more of people's stories and uh, seeing the trends emerge because I think the more data that uh, comes out over time, the, the better and more profound this is going to be for a lot of people. I can completely relate to that. Yeah, there's... um. It seems to be that the carnival diet originally started as like a elimination diet for people with water immunity, people that want to lose a bit of weight. You know, it's like they want to get back to square one, basically. But um, what we're seeing now and now is when people stay on the diet, see all the benefits, and all those like little niggles and injuries that people have over time seem to add up. They notice as that time goes on, they seem to improve um, dramatically in other areas as well. I mean, what was it that appealed to you about the carnival diet? What was it that you thought, okay, I'm going to try this out for? Yeah, this reason. Sure. So when I first heard of the carnivore diet, I was really skeptical. I was following a ketogenic diet at the time, and I was really trying to optimize my ketogenic diet to meet all of the U.S. dietary guidelines as far as uh, RDAs for everything. So um, I went to a ketogenic diet from a higher carb diet because I had heard that ketogenic diets can be somewhat therapeutic for migraines, and I was having really terrible migraines, probably once every 10 or so days I was calling in for, to work. Um, I was starting to get like write-ups and get in trouble at work for calling in so often, but I would have migraines that made it really hard to function. And when I started doing ketogenic diets, um, that completely eliminated my migraines and I was having headaches almost daily. And it basically eliminated probably 90 plus percent of all the headaches I was having. So I spent a lot of time, a lot of my free time listening to Joe Rogan podcast. And I heard Sean Baker talking about how we basically lived off of ribeye steaks. And here's a guy that was in his early 50s, I think at the time, had been like a two or three year carnivore and was setting multiple world records for indoor rowing. And I was thinking like, okay, like if he's strict carnivore, and as far as I can tell, he's not taking any supplements, no multivitamins, anything. There's obviously, there can't be anything major that's deficient in this diet him to be achieving this level of athletic superiority. Um, and then shortly after that, you know, with the YouTube search algorithms, um, I saw uh, Michaela Peterson's interview on Joe Rogan. And she talked about how through kind of brute force experimentation, she went down to eventually figuring out the only diet that didn't trigger massive inflammation in her was basically red meat and salt. So seeing these two opposite sides of the carnivore spectrum, somebody who came to it solely because of inflammation and somebody who was achieving, you know, world-class elite levels of athleticism, I thought, well, th this diet can't be lacking in anything. I don't, I don't care what the RDAs are, what the government guidelines are. This diet cannot be missing anything significant. Otherwise, these people would not be able to sustain, you know, a quality of life. So I tried it um, largely by caprice at that point. I said, okay, like the hell with it. I'm just going to try the carnivore diet. And I was married at the time. And excuse me, I used to do the cooking for my family. So naturally we started eating a lot more red meats. I would make vegetables, but I would like not eat, you know, my broccoli. My wife and my daughter would eat it. Um, and I would just tell them like, ah, I, yeah, I kind of wanted to, I didn't just tell my wife at the time, I'm just going to try this. I kind of wanted to pussyfoot around it a little bit. So I tell her, I just, you know, I really want my broccoli tonight. Um, and I noticed that after three days on carnivore, my bedroom was on the second floor of my house. I, I got up in the morning. I think like, God, I, I slept really, really well. 
And I started walking downstairs and I remember thinking like, you know, my hips, my knees, my ankles, like they don't hurt at all. They're not bothering me. And when I went to put my socks and shoes on that morning, instead of bending over slightly to the side because of joint pain, I was able to just bend straight over. So there was something in the ketogenic diet that I was eating at the time, probably chia seeds um, or the massive amount of greens that I was eating that was causing a significant degree of inflammation. And I just remember thinking like, God, I just, I feel really good just eating about three pounds of red meat a day. And after the first like three, four or five days, I just said, okay, I'm going to stick with this. And I was strict 100% red meat, salt and water for about 15 months. Um, so that's kind of how I got into carnivore. That's interesting stuff. Yeah. I can understand how someone that was following uh, previously the American diet and probably admittedly for yourself, a a better version of it to some degree. Um, you're looking at the RDAs and thinking, okay, I could be missing all these things. But now looking down the line, nearly five years later, um, you don't look to me to be someone that's deficient. Um, and that's evident in your training performance and your f- physical composition. Um, what can you tell me about your, your training as a result of the diet? Has it changed at all? Is anything different? Um, yeah. Is recovery so, better? What's going on? Sure. So oddly enough, um, when I, my training style, the, the degree of high intensity training that I do goes back to about 2014, 2015. Um, when my wife got pregnant, I used food like a drug and I gained a bunch of weights and I turned to Mike Menser heavy duty training as a literal last resort. It was the only training protocol I could find that would actually fit into my schedule at the time. And I started getting really, really good strength gains from that style of training. But um, then I said, okay, if this training works, I'm going to diet the same way that Mike Menzer recommended, which was 60% carbohydrate, 25% protein, 15% fat. And even though I lost 90 pounds in a year following that style of diet, I, I still had massive headaches, migraines all the time. And I was eating tons of sugar to try and hit that 60% carbohydrate threshold. Um, so when I switched from a very carbohydrate heavy diet to a ketogenic diet, you know, I really didn't see a significant decrease in performance. And I credit that largely to the fact that um, high intensity training as a style of exercise is very intense, very brief, and very infrequent. Um, so if your sets or your workouts are only, you know, 60 to 90 seconds for a set and maybe 20 or so minutes for a workout, I tend to think that you can just mentally be tough enough to try and overcome, if not, you know, bare minimum, at least mitigate the potential weaknesses you may have from massively changing your diet very quickly. So I really didn't experience any significant drop-offs in strength. And when I switched from a ketogenic diet to carnivore, um, my strength actually improved very, very quickly for a brief amount of time. So I don't know if it was just getting more cholesterol that facilitated recovery, um, maybe a little bit more potassium than I was eating. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but I, I saw a marked improvement in all of my lifts when I went from ketogenic t- to carnivore. In terms of recovery, um, I'm noticing that the more I eat, and especially the higher my fat is, my recovery tends to be a lot faster. I used to need probably four to five days between workouts to recover when I was eating 60% carbohydrate. And at any given point in time, my diet now is maybe at least a percentage by calories, probably about 70% fat, 30% protein. Um, if I push a little higher in fat, um, I can probably get away with working out every other day. Um, sometimes I just feel like I, I need a little bit more rest, so I'll take another day to recover. But in general, my recovery time has shortened and I've had zero decrease in strength. Uh, a couple of years later, compared to the, when I first started carnivore, I'm, I'm still every bit as strong as I've ever been. Um, and I can recover faster and lift heavier weights. So the transition has been, has been awesome. That's impressive. That matches my anecdote as well. Um, I've tried the keto diet in the past, but I think the problem with the keto diet is the, the outlines themselves, they allow you to have 50 grams of carbs, which you, you know, people are going to be putting in berries and fruit and nuts and things in there, which is in pretty much every case deleterious to human health. Anyway, um, getting rid yeah. of those plant foods seem to be one of the main benefits. Um, how can you how can you how can you talk about the the benefits in terms of things outside of training in the gym? Like, are you more social? Is your are you easier to get along with? Like, is life generally better for you in some regards? 
Yeah. So I've always been um, somewhat of a, of a private person. And my individualism is far from nascent. So I, I'm not too social in that regard. And I've always been fairly mild mannered, pretty even keel most of the time. But I've noticed that the more strict I am with my diet, um, things are just kind of level. Um, I don't get as frustrated as quickly. My sleep is better. I'm, I'm sleeping deeper and falling asleep faster in general. And when hard times in my life happen, the more strict I can be with my diet, the more I'm able to recognize that there's an issue, but not dwell on it quite so hard. And you've known me for probably dating back since right around November or so. I think it's right around the time that you and I started talking. And right around that time was around a really, really hard time in my life. Uh, me and my fiance split up. Um, she was the most incredible woman I had ever met. And that was um, one of the hardest times in my life. And when I decided a couple months ago to get back into really, really, really strict carnivore, for me, I noticed that eating stupid high levels of fat and keeping my diet really, really clean allowed me to better process a lot of that mental and emotional stress that I was going through. Um, so it's unfortunate because there's a lot of good people that really struggle to process stress, emotional issues, mental issues, anxiety. And I think we drastically undersell the importance of diet. Um, and just uh, for whatever reason that is, I, I would suspect, you know, as inflammatory as most diets are, it, it reduces your brain's ability to operate uh, effectively or optimally. And that has consequences in how you think and how you behave. Um, but for me, I've noticed that the, the more strict I am with my diet, the more I can just acknowledge things for what they are when they're hard. And the more I'm able to focus on whatever it is I'm trying to accomplish at that time. It sounds to me like you've become, um, in, in essence, more, more stoic. You have, the better, you have a, um, better abilities to tolerate things and deal with things that would otherwise really bug you. I mean, do you think that's due to um, drastic changes in blood glucose in your previous diet? Or would you say there's some sort of other key factor that's been um, pivotal in terms of doing the carnivore diet? Yeah, I would think there's, um, you know, our bodies are always constantly changing, right? There's something like every single cell in your body is replaced over a period of seven years and different tissues turn over at different rates. You know, blood cells are like every two months or so, liver cells, I think once every two to three years. But every seven years, it's a brand new you and it, it's kind of an inspiring metaphor. But it makes me think at the same time, if it, if it takes people years to get into a certain condition or certain degrees of... Um, maligned health, then it's going to take a, a somewhat proportionate amount of time to recover from that. So somebody could probably look at my blood markers now being very, very close, you know, 95 plus percent, you know, strict carnivore and think that it looked pretty good. But I, I still think there's a lot of healing and growing behind the scenes that takes years to replace and years to fix. Um, so I'm, I'm stoic in my ability to tolerate stress and to handle seemingly ever increasing levels of it. But uh, ironically enough, I'm trying to be more passionate and more emotive when I speak with people because I can better convey my emotions and make more of a connection, you know, if I'm not just completely dead inside whenever I engage with someone. Yeah, I can imagine that's very beneficial for your working with your clientele in your studio, um, being more engaged in conversations, being more personable. It's something that I'm, um, I find inspirational about yourself, someone that had mm. difficulties in your past, which we'll probably go into in a second. Um, sure. I had speech and language therapy, and I'm still someone that doesn't speak very clearly at times. I stammer my words, and it's something that's very challenging for me. Um, yeah. Now, I'm guessing this kind of goes into how you've improved your business over the last year or so since you um, started up the studio. So can you perhaps go back in your timeline to like how you were you know, several years ago to how you are now, like how you're better able to convey your message like you just mentioned. Sure. So similarly, um, when I was four or five years old, I was in speech therapy. I had a really hard time pronouncing my R's. And with a name like Jerome, <laughs> you know, everybody <laughs> thinks that your name is something different than it is. Everybody thought my name was Jerome. And I grew up really hating my name. And it was so hard for people to understand me when I was really young that 
I just decided to isolate. Like, why would I talk to people if they're having trouble understanding me? So I grew up really shy, really introverted, um, really kind of in my own world. And it wasn't really until, you know, a number of years ago. And I, I, there's no single cause that really made me kind of step outside my shell a little bit. Um, probably the most direct course of action was uh, a couple of years before the pandemic. I hired Skip LaCour as kind of a business coach. I, I looked at this guy and I thought, here's a guy that's doing what I want to do. He just does phone coaching with clients. He's in incredible shape for a, a 60 or 61 year old. Um, definitely the top 1% of the 1% for people in his age group makes many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and is changing lives. He's making the world a better place. And he does it in a way where he doesn't shit on people. He's never bringing out the negative in people or situations. He has this beautiful way to always see the best. And some of his stories, he's a guy that is very quick to open up about his struggles that he's had. And I just thought, God, like I, I want to do what this guy is doing. So I hired him to be my coach for a year and I started doing phone coaching. And <laughs> as you well know, going from you know ground zero to try and build a business, especially in the wild west that is the internet, it's a difficult niche to try and carve out, especially the fitness world. You know, the fitness industry is replete with individuals who are not only genetically gifted, but are so inculcated in their ways that you know, just by virtue of their physique, they could sell a $50 ebook and have hundreds, if not thousands of people to help buy it. And to try and do things correctly and ethically and, and building people up and trying to improve the tangible factors of their lives, not just their physique, that's a really hard gig to get into and to really separate yourself from the crowd. It's, it's one of the things that drew me to you. So working with Skip for a year gave me a lot of perspective. And it made me far more um, introspective with human nature and really listening to people and learning a lot about myself. And I really learned that, yes, you need to know your information, but what people are really investing in is a relationship with you. Like, Do they trust you as an individual? And are they confident and certain in the plan that you're presenting that it's going to take them from where they currently are to ultimately where they want to be? If people don't buy into you it's not because they're unsure about your product it's it's you as an individual that they're buying into like that's what they're paying for is that trust in that relationship um so i'm i'm plenty willing to talk about the struggles that i've had you know everybody wants to put forward these pictures of of guys making you know seven figures driving sports cars living in mansions you know, that doesn't do shit for me that doesn't inspire me or motivate me at all I want to hear about when that guy was struggling to pay his bills, working third shift at a grocery store, stocking shelves with a sore back and thinking, how am I going to put food on the table this month? And then what got him out of that? Because more people can connect with that because more people are in that position right now. Um, so that's kind of what really started getting me out of that was doing phone coaching with Skip. Then the pandemic hit. And last year, I tested positive uh, for the virus of unknown origin and back in January. And for a long time, I've been wanting to write a book on the philosophy of fitness, but present everything I know about diet and exercise from first principles. As you know, most of our dietary recommendations come from epidemiology. We loosely study populations for a period of time. We draw inference based on their health outcomes. And to me, that's a little silly when we know the hard science of how the human body works in a lot of different ways with respect to exercise and nutrition. So why are we drawing inference from something with tons of confounding variables when we know physically how the human body operates in a very precise and carefully regulated manner with a lot of different things with respect to diet, nutrition, and exercise? Um, so I tested positive for the virus and I had to quarantine. And in quarantining, I, I took five days where I just didn't have basically any human contact. And I just wrote in this book. And I have, I think, almost 200 pages in this book written that I'll eventually get done. Um, and these were some of the best days of my life. And I remember thinking, God, every day of my life could be like this. And every day of my life should be like this. And I remember thinking, like, how the hell can I tell my daughter to chase her dreams and to do what makes her happy and to live her life on her terms if I'm not willing to do the same? So over the course of my quarantine, 
I, uh, I wrote up my two weeks notice for work. And I think three days after I went back to work, I turned in my two weeks notice, um, left my job, very quickly started shopping for a place, started putting together resources. And, and so much of starting a business, and you know this too, is you just have to figure shit out as you go. You know, people, whether it's starting a business, whether it's trying to get their diet and exercise structured, too many people have the habit of just trying to get everything perfectly lined up. They want all their ducks in a row before they get started. But you know this, well, sometimes you just have to jump off the cliff without a parachute and figure shit out in free fall and, and figure it out along the way and make it happen. And sometimes you have to put yourself in a position where your only option is to succeed. And uh, I thought, what a what a great place to be. You know, I'm good with that anxiety that comes from like, how am I going to pay my bills? You know, how am I going to eat? How am I going to take care of my daughter? Um, what am I going to do tomorrow that's going to put me one step closer towards having a successful business? I, I like the idea of losing sleep over those questions. It, it feels like being alive. So I, I know I've, this is a very long winded answer. I apologize, but there's a lot of intricate pieces that have sort of contributed towards pointing my life in the direction that it's moving now. It's fascinating stuff. Definitely. Um, just taking all that in has been very interesting because I, I do know you on a personal level. And like you said, since November, but all that extra added information, it's um, been quite, quite a revelation really. Cause I remember watching you on Bart K's YouTube channel when he interviewed you and you talked about some stuff about training and diet. Um, and that was roughly a week before um, I went on his channel. Yeah. So for about a period of two to three months after that, I was looking at the view count of your one and my one, and I was comparing <laughs> myself to you, Jerome. Um, yeah, and I thought interesting. it's interesting because I was doing that from a point of envy because I thought, wow, this guy's aspirational. He's like another fitness trainer kind of guy, knows a lot about bodybuilding, I was like, what do I have to do with myself to be better than this guy? So I wasn't thinking uh, to spite you or was, there was no malice or anything. It's more, he's doing something right. You know, he's inspiring me. I want to achieve what he's achieving. Um, so now I'm grateful for the friendship that we do now have. And that's um, been very mutually beneficial, I'd say. Um, we're, a lot ab we're, a lot, we're able to a lot better convey our messages about nutrition and training. And I hopefully... Yeah. Um, that will inspire some more people down the road. And obviously people will look at us and say, oh, you know, we've had it easy because we're always in shape. But that's not true, is it, Jerome? I mean, where yeah. are you at a few years ago? Where, where did you start, like, in terms of your body weight to where you are now? Sure. So I've always, um, I've always had a real interest for physical culture. You know, I was a child of the 80s. I grew up watching Schwarzenegger and Stallone movies. And I just remember thinking, like, I, I want this. I, wanna, I liked the idea of masculinity. And unfortunately, I was a little bit of a heavy kid growing up. Um, I got really big into running shortly after high school. And when I reached a certain level of leanness after all that running, I, I was like 159 pounds at five foot 11, but I didn't have any muscle. <laughs> so um, I started lifting weights to try and put some, put some muscle on it. I responded fairly well to it. But yeah, my story really begins back in 2012. Uh, my wife got pregnant and I used food like a drug to handle the stress. And I gained something like 80 plus pounds over the course of her pregnancy. And I ballooned up to 297 pounds. And I just remember how bad I felt most of the time and how hard it was to just do, you know, sometimes you can't breathe sometimes when you're putting your shoes on because your, your stomach's in the way and it obstructs your breathing. Um, and I was on the I was a volunteer firefighter at the time. I was going to college. I was uh, working 40 hours a week, trying to move my way up the uh, company ladder at Costco. Um, that was a really hard time in my life. And it's, it's easy to look at someone who has a great physique and think that they have it easy. And a lot of times, you know, sometimes what drives what people to have that physique in the first place is they're using the regimented lifestyle that comes with diet and exercise as a way to escape some kind of personal hell or pain. You know, some people are into video games, some people are into reading or music, some people are into fitness. Um, they're all things that we can use in our life to either move towards a chosen goal or in a lot of people's cases to try and move away from some, some kind of deep-seated pain. So what makes 
me and you able to actualize certain physique goals is just our willingness to endure, you know, more short term discomfort for the long term gain. You know, we track our diets a little bit more closely than average people. We push ourselves a little bit harder. We have, you know, the genetic predisposition to build a certain amount of size, but there's not nearly as big of a gap between a really, really impressive physique and just kind of an average looking physique. Someone that you just kind of look at and be like, yeah, he's in, he's in pretty decent shape. You know, that, that big of a gap is the difference in that is just really, really slight changes in behavior just carried out for a long period of time. Yeah. It almost reminds me of that, um, that expression, you know, hard work beats talent. And I think in our yeah. case, it's a case of, you know, when hard work and talent come together, you know, miracles can happen. So what mm -hmm. I'll do is, um, I'll make sure I link your stuff below in this video. And what I also want to mention is people are always concerned about numbers, macros, calories, grams, food. What is your current diet? Because I know everyone likes to help people's current sure. diet. Or... Yeah, I, I, I still am playing things pretty fast and loose. And to kind of piggyback on your last point, you're 100% right. Hard work beats talents almost every single time. And yeah, eventually people can get to the point where they're, they have some aptitude for both, but you can always gain the knowledge. But most people just don't get started. So the, the far more important thing, sometimes even more than the the precise approach that you're using is just moving in that direction. Just get going, start doing something, and then you can always learn more and raise your standards and take things to a higher level. Um, my diet right now, I just, I, I'm playing things very, very casually. You and I have a project we're working on, so I'm kind of getting back into dieting. But at the moment, I'm just kind of loosely following the, the P to E diet and making sure I'm hitting about 1.5 grams of protein uh, for every one gram of fat. And I'm, you know, the, it's pretty easy to just look at the nutrition label and kind of come up with what proportion of food you need to make that happen. And I'm just eating when I'm hungry. I'm eating until I'm not hungry. And if I'm not hungry, I'm not eating. And at least for me with my experience and as long as I've been doing carnivore, I don't need to make it any more complicated than that for now. If I wanted to put some muscle mass on and, and do a, some more little bit extreme things with my body, then I would ratchet up the level of, of attention and discipline that I'm putting into my diet. Um, so yeah, you're hundred percent right. Everybody wants to know what everyone's eating, but instead of it's human nature to look at different approaches and try and pick apart what makes them different. But people instead should do the opposite. They should look at all these different approaches that me, that you, that Alicia, that, uh, anybody else in the carnivore space are doing and say, what do all these things have in common? And, and finding those commonalities between very similar approaches is going to do somebody a lot better than try and pick apart what makes every single unique approach a little bit different. Yeah, that's very well said. I think there's um, lots of ideas going around, lots of perhaps dogma about the carnivore diet, you know, ratios, percentages, grams per this, grams per that. Um, Ultimately, our body doesn't really know grams. It doesn't understand, doesn't have a gramometer, if that's the right word. It just has, yeah. it has um, sensory input meters. It knows, okay, I've got this nutrition or I don't have it. There is or isn't enough. There's a surplus or a deficiency or, you know, there's never going to be an exact equilibrium. We're not robotic in that sense. But um, yep. as Farrah well said, and I think the value mm -hmm. of eating intuitively is probably what is at least the most important thing. That I've learned about the carnivore diet itself. Um, yeah. What's your current training like now? Um, I know you started on the, you know, the Mike Mentzer high intensity training philosophies. Like what does a sample week of workout look for you? Sure. So to, to try and keep it somewhat succinct, I personally prefer doing a push pull legs split. I'll do anywhere from one to probably three sets per muscle group per workout. Um, so my total workouts are maybe anywhere from four to seven or eight total sets of workout. Um, I'll work out every third day in general, sometimes every other day, um, sometimes every fourth day, but in general, every third day. And uh, I push every set as hard as I can, as close to <laughs> total muscle failure as I can uh, without compromising safety. Um, and I mentioned one to three sets because it really depends how you're counting it. Muscle groups like triceps are worked on any kind of compound pushing movement. So one to three sets of muscle group, uh, push pull legs, 
anywhere from probably two to four workouts a week, depending on diet, sleep, how my body responds, and just pushing hard. And if you're doing that, you, you don't need to get too precise with it. Perfect. Yeah, that sounds, sounds sensible. We could probably have to do another talk about your training methodologies at another time. Um, so with all that being said, where can people found, find you if you want to be found? Like what socials do you use? You know, what's your sure. website? Yeah, so the best way to uh, message me if somebody wants to talk is probably Instagram. My Instagram handle is at Rational Muscle, all is one word. Um, I have a Facebook, or sorry, YouTube is probably next best, uh, youtube.com um, slash Jerome dot Armstrong. Um, otherwise, find me in the description of this video. Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, I look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, thank you for having me on.